I'm King Link, and this week we're going to be talking about emulation. And it'd be pretty easy to talk about just emulators, but instead we're going to actually have to talk about the other side of this argument, piracy. This means that it's time to talk about emulators and ROMs. I wanted to cover this in three distinct sections. First, I wanted to talk about what emulation and ROMs are at a very high level. Second, we'll talk about why people emulate and play ROMs. And finally, we'll be talking about my thoughts on it. I can actually address this from multiple angles as I'm a gamer, but I also was a game developer. I even had people tell me they pirated my game. True story, and hopefully that will be an interesting angle. But why discuss emulation and ROMs? Doesn't everyone already understand them? If so, I could just post a quick overview and get to why. But as I started to write this script, I actually saw this post on Twitter. The account has been deleted now. Maybe it was a troll, but here's the important picture. If you're not able to see the video, it's a SpongeBob meme posted by someone named Nero Shen, with SpongeBob holding up a sign that said... People who emulate games should be fined and sent to jail for theft. Emulation is illegal and hurts the industry. I pay for my games, so should you. It's only fear. Being a little snarky with that voice there, but I think it's deserved. Now, most people on Twitter did respond to this correctly, if a bit vitriolic. That's probably why the account has been deleted. And a majority of people probably already know all of this, but it's also clear that some people don't know the distinction, such as Nero Shen. He's hardly the only one, and as such, we'll go over a quick version of what emulation and ROMs are. If you already know or don't care, click the second chapter or go to the timestamp that I'll put on screen now. And just as a note, this isn't intended as a perfect explanation. There's probably a hundred asterisks or further dives I could do on the topic, even extending it beyond gaming, but we'll keep this tight. Emulation, though, is the idea that you can create a program that will interpret game code in the same way the original hardware worked. That's at least the theory behind it. There's a lot of differences in there as well, and that's a point for later for the upgrades. But for the most part, if you have an NES cartridge, it should run on an emulator the same as it would run on a real NES. You get the same game, same experience, and if done right, every game that runs on an NES would run on a perfect emulator. Now this is different than simulation, which attempts to recreate the experience, such as playing a DDR simulator, which doesn't run the official DDR files. They are slightly different mentalities to the development. Emulation is trying to create a one-to-one -one representation of what some device would do. And here's the important part. Emulation is completely legal. Many people will claim Sony Computer Entertainment of America uh, vs. Bleem LLC made emulation legal. This was one of the big and only major court cases about an emulator. It's actually a misunderstanding though. Sony's case against Bleem is interesting, but based on using comparative screenshots of the PlayStation. On the other hand, there is Sony Computer Entertainment Inc. vs. ConnectX Corp. for the Virtual Game Station, which pretty much sets the precedent. However, I'm not a lawyer, I just like legal documents, and if you are interested in reading up on this, hire an attorney if you want to know more, or if you like legal drama and history, you can always check out Gaming Historian's video on both of these court cases. It's an amazing dive. And this week, I'm mostly going to be using these, my NES Classic Edition, my Super NES Classic Edition, my Genesis Mini, and of course my PlayStation Classic, because why else did I buy all of these devices? Every one of them uses emulation and ROMs, so clearly emulation isn't all bad. Yet, I still have this giant wall of games as well, including multiple NES games, Nintendo DS, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, Xbox, PS3, PS4, I think there's some Xbox One titles somewhere, so why not just play any of these on an emulator for this video? That's the other side of this topic, and perhaps the more important one. While emulation is completely legal, at least as far as current case law, the files to play the games are... Dubious. There are public domain ROMs, which are people who created games that can run on emulators and are legal to play by anyone. However, to play any of my collection of games, you're going to need the computer files that are the entire dump of the memory. Emulators need the data from the cartridges or disk media, which was stored on read-only memory, or ROMs for short, which is why they're called that. And to return to that meme one more time, Nero Shen was completely wrong about emulation, but to give him the benefit of the doubt, I do think he meant ROMs or piracy here, not emulation directly. Fair enough, but I still disagree, at least partially. So to get ROMs for emulation, you need to go to download ROMs online, which is illegal, though it is really punished, it's not something I can or will recommend. Or, on the other hand, you can dump files yourselves, whether it be ripping the CDs, which is relatively easy, or using a device like Retrod, 
uh, to download them yourself, which is more dubious, probably legal, but let's just say I don't want to be the one to create any new court precedents, as in the case of both Bleem and Connectix, both companies won their court cases, but also closed shortly after because the legal process is quite expensive and, of course, the bigger corporation can outspend you. There is also BIOS, which is the basic input-output system of a system. Uh, without getting way too technical for this video, that's also copyrighted and can't be shared similar to ROMs, even though, of course, some people may do that online and some emulators will require those. So, basically, though, emulation is completely legal. ROMs can be legal, but almost always aren't. And with all those definitions and explanations out of the way, we can finally move on to part two. Why? Why would anyone want to emulate when they could just play through the original game on the original hardware? Old hardware isn't that expensive and old games can't cost too much, right? On that point, we'll start there. People like free. You know, as much as everything else I say in this video, the fact is many people emulate and use ROMs because they want to play games that they don't own or have some trouble playing. Their systems might break, their cards might break, but really they want to play a game and would rather get it for free right now versus sometime in the future and for a decent price. I'm not going to be diving into whether it's considered a lost sale or not. I think actually both sides of the argument are wrong on that front. Not every pirate will buy, but I also think some pirates would. The other common trope about this is that piracy is a service issue. That's often held up, usually done so incorrectly, I think. It directly contradicts the idea that not every pirate would buy the game if given the option. Truthfully, people just want to play games and don't want to pay. That's a big reason to get into piracy and potentially emulation. Now, the second reason for emulation, though, is more important. It's the ease of use. I ripped a lot of DVDs at one point because I just liked watching stuff on my computers and not having to find my favorite DVDs to watch those movies. Also, just swapping DVDs was a pain. It also helped that when I mishandled my DVDs sometimes, but being able to just select any game I own is better than having to find the cart, hope it works, switch the system on and off with each attempt, you know, blow into the cart, all that stuff. Thank God for emulation because this is honestly really easy now and the old hardware and cards have issues. The third reason you might want to emulate is speedrunning. And here, by the way, is my epic hardcore no death run of Super Mario Bros. Oh, damn it, over already. Speedrunners, though, need a few things. Reliability is huge. Not relying on hardware can be important, especially because sometimes that hardware breaks, as I mentioned. And on the other hand, though, sometimes that real hardware helps. P.S. That's insane. Heating up your cartridge or swapping out cartridges to get a speedrun is as amazing as it gets. But a consistent game is a huge benefit for speedrunners, and it's worth mentioning it also helps them examine the game as well. Which actually brings us to the fourth and my personal favorite reason. Emulation allows players to add features to games and more often the systems that it's running on. Good old save states being the big one that most fans might think of. Save states might be the only way I can beat many NES games. Not to mention there's a ton of additional features such as cheat codes, memory examination, speed ups, slowdowns. Um, my personal favorite is actually using your own controller rather than whatever controller they allowed you to use on the system. Seriously, the NES controller feels awful. There's also subtle fixes. Emulation can actually fix mistakes made in the game, not changing the game's code necessarily, but allowing improved visuals and graphics. It can also allow fixes such as screen flickering due to sprite limitations if the players want that. You also can update the actual ROMs with hacks to fix any issues there as well, and players can also update and play new versions of the ROMs, which is why several great Japanese-only RPGs have fan translations that will never get official releases. Players can experience major games that never reached their country or potentially their language, such as Police Knots by Hideo Kojima, or the Mother series was originally fans translated, which is why part of it grew in America, outside of, of course, Earthbound. Um, and players have been experiencing these games for decades because of emulation and ROMs. Mother continues to be a very popular series in America because people have seen the series with fan translation first. And then there's what I'll call modernization, but really it's my personal favorite reason Achievements. Retroachievements.org has actually found a way to add achievements to classic video games and players can now earn achievements on multiple old platforms including but not limited to the Atari 2600, the NES, the Genesis, they even have a version that does the PlayStation which is so cool. If you don't care about any of these features, of course, getting the original hardware can be the best way to experience old games because it's the authentic experience. But there's still a lot of reasons to legally want to emulate games, as well as reasons why people will emulate their favorite games, even if they already own a copy of it. 
So it's time to get into that really sticky part of this discussion. Does any of this make it right? First, make your own decisions. You know, I'm just some guy on the internet. I just wanted to talk about this from my viewpoint and what I think about emulation and ROMs. And let's start with that juicy part of the story I teased. I made video games for about 12 years. I worked on Saints Row 2, Red Faction Guerrilla, Red Faction Armageddon, Carnival Island, and at least 7 years of MLB The Show, not to mention various platforms for each. I've made a lot of games, and I think I calculated it's like 30 different SKUs at one point in my life. So there was a time that I was talking to someone in person, which it was at a party or at a store, and... Honestly, this sounds really alien to me now because, you know, the last year and so, but they had heard I made Saints Row 2. Not completely unheard of, you know, I did like to mention it every once in a while, but this time the guy said, oh yeah, I pirated that game. It was awesome. I loved it. So, it's a weird thing to say, but I kind of asked him about pirating it because he was so bladed about it, and without any embarrassment, his answer was, well, you know, I wasn't going to buy it. In my memory, I actually do think he called it like a weak GTA clone or something. That could be an embellishment I've added, but he said this straight to my face knowing I had worked on it. So how does that make me feel? Well, the time period for this was at least six years after the game launched. Saints Row 3 and Saints Row 4 was already out. I wasn't with Volition anymore. And I kind of hated it still. Not for the theft necessarily, but more for the naked idiocy of the comment. Don't go up and tell the director you enjoyed their movie on streaming, but didn't or wouldn't pay for it. I know that does happen, of course, but come on. This was such a stupid interaction that it has stuck with me for probably half a decade at this point. And at the moment, a flash of anger did happen because, you know, the guy didn't pay and he didn't have a right to play my game. At least that's my mentality at the time. I firmly believe in paying for games you want to play. If you buy a game and pirate a version that doesn't have DRM, you know, I understand that. You should have the right to play games in the best format. I have this idea of a centralized digital rights system which will transfer between consoles, but that's a story for a completely different time. At the same time, though, I've been thinking about that interaction a lot, and I came to some conclusions. As a developer, I wouldn't get that much money from the sale, if anything at all. As a programmer, a studio paid me a lot of money before the game came out to make that game, and there were some bonuses post-launch, of course. That studio was also paid a lot of money to make the game from a publisher, sometimes more than one. And I've actually heard the argument that publishers take the largest cut of the money of a game sale, which is true, and some people will rationalize piracy because of that, that's a bad argument, though, because the publisher has already fronted all the money up to that point to the developer, and the developer entered into an agreement about that revenue split. It makes sense that the publisher gets a large cut, but also remember that solid sales from a title usually shows that the developer is a good investment, which decides which games to make in the future. But the real problem comes when I want to play an old discontinued game, and this is actually where I get into very murky water. You see, buying old games doesn't help anyone that it should. It does show that there might be interest in the title, but after a while, sales don't matter as much, especially when we're talking about used game sales. Eventually, games stop being sold in stores, and there's a finite number of copies of a title in circulation. While publishers can reprint popular games, this is exceedingly rare, especially when the platform is dead. I still remember paying almost 80 bucks because I wanted a copy of Disgaea in the PS2 era, and they woefully underprinted that. That was before they issued a reprint, but that purchase of a second-hand copy didn't benefit anyone at Nipponichi Software or Atlas because I bought used. Having a used game market is of course good, and the resale of games is important to the industry as it expands the reach of games. It's also important as a consumer right, but it doesn't help the developers directly. Now, I understand some people will collect games, and I still have my collection of games right here if you forgot, look at it again. However, wanting to play an exceedingly rare game and having to pay more than the original price for it, sometimes multiples of the original price, is not fair. Buying a game for over $100 just to play the game doesn't make a ton of sense. It also doesn't benefit the original publisher, developer, or individuals who worked on the game. And I understand the appeal of collecting or having a full collection for a platform. If that's the goal, paying $100 might make sense there for the rarity. But wanting to experience some games that are out of print or unavailable from the publishers, and then being forced to pay exorbitant prices to collectors, collectors in quotes there, doesn't make a lot of sense. Which is where I think emulation starts to make more sense. One caveat to this is that, of course, digital games don't leave print. You can buy them whenever you want, which is mostly true. 
Recently, PS3 and the Vita network were going to shut down, and when that happens, some games will be lost forever. Though, as a quick note, Sony did back down from that. However, I still don't see this as a permanent win. One day, sooner than later probably, Sony will eventually shut down their PS3 network. And I understand that. They are fully able to do that. It's been 15 years that it's been up, and it probably cost them a lot more than we realized to run. I do worry, though, that we'll be seeing the loss of quite a few online-only games there. I personally really like Tokyo Jungle for the PS3, and that actually never got a physical release in America. While I could try to keep my PS3 in good working condition and keep it on my hard drive, that limits it to just that unit. And that leads me to another big reason I like emulation. I like the idea that we're preserving our history as a fandom. There's a lot of people who may have never played an NES, and while a lot of famous games are now in the Switch Classic games, there's even more that aren't. The NES had over 700 titles released, and while the Classic Game Library has over 80, they don't have everything. Part of the reason is they don't have the rights to games, and sometimes those rights are a mess, but they also don't seem to care to get every game or realize how expensive that might be. For instance, I didn't expect them to pick up Guardian Legends, but I'm glad that there's a way for me to play Guardian Legends today because I actually enjoy this game, well, mostly. If you want to know, yes, that is actually my original copy and my original manual in the picture. Developers and system creators don't really care that much about the full scope of all the releases on a console, so it becomes a problem that fans need to maintain the full history of these amazing systems, and emulation has done wonders. He was actually a guy who's grabbed every Atari 2600 ROM he's ever seen, including multiple pirated copies and bootlegs that were created by other companies, and it's an amazing archive. Emulation will continue to be important for another reason, though. There is a concern that the PS3 has a major issue where if the CMOS battery ever dies, it requires logging on the PlayStation Network after being replaced, which is also a pretty major replacement to my knowledge. I don't know how true this story is, but it shows that even the hardware will have its limitations over time, and whenever that network is shut down, players will lose the ability to repair the hardware. I'm sure some hacker will figure out a solution, but it appears PS5, uh, PS4, Xbox One, others have similar switches in place. And with hardware dying, as well as the networks itself, eventually the only way that players will have to experience these systems will be emulation. Of course, physical media has this habit of being damaged, which means over time that finite supply of games will only decrease. And that's great news, of course, for collectors, but for historians and fans who just want to experience older titles, you know, that's just not great. There's also a few games that have only a handful of known copies around, such as Tetris for the Genesis, of which only 10 physical copies were originally made, I believe. Good old legal emulation gives us this game, and also, you know, this version kind of sucks. There's also the fact that when these networks shut down, patching games become impossible, and suddenly you're left with the launch version of these games, and that's becoming a more frightening thought with every major release. Imagine Cyberpunk 2077, but you can only play the launch version. Horrific, even worse when you consider most games now have a mandatory day one patch which will also be lost. So with all that said, I think it's clear where I lie. Emulation is completely legal and I think it's required both as a community of gamers as well as developers. Emulation allows us to keep the legacy of developers work alive long beyond what the hardware or the medium that the developers chose allow. On the other hand, if there is a way to support developers, publishers, or creators of the media, usually through legally buying the game from them, that should be the first thing you do. That support is important to help the creators keep creating games, and hopefully this will grow with the creation of digital games. There are quite a few games and Steam that are over 15 years old, and that money should go to the creator. But ultimately, there's a point where some games aren't available anymore, and that's where I think ROMs and piracy might start to be warranted. The idea of abandonware has been around for decades, and I think that it's something that the industry needs to find a way to officially accept in some format. It's one thing if you're constantly releasing updated versions of your game, like Skyrim or GTA V, but once fans can't buy those titles on the digital platforms, or they close down, it's more important than ever that those titles be preserved. And it's a great thing to be able to remember our history, but also to have access to our history is important as fans of the medium. I do also want to mention, at least one uh, developer mentioned that he doesn't like to compete against ROMs or old games. And, you know, there already are free-to-play games, there already are free titles out there that you can p play without paying. If you're competing against an NES game and you are struggling because somehow that game is better, maybe look at what you're putting out. That's all.
Anyways, I'm going to continue pushing for emulation ROMs, not because I want to get free modern games, I really don't, but because I want the ability to go back and see what former systems are about. Because we should realize that one day, every modern system will be as old as the NES and Atari 2600, and when that happens, there will be super futuristic games, but someone's going to want to come back and see what, you know, Hades was all about. Hopefully they have a legal and interesting way to check it out. That's what I have for this week for emulation and ROMs. Honestly, it's a topic I've had a changing and evolving view over, you know, all my years. When I was younger, I was, of course, on the piracy side. When I started making games that other people pirated, I quickly switched against it. Trust me, seeing a torrent of your game really does change your opinion. Now that I'm past the point of developing games, I still don't love piracy of active games. I am fully against that, but it's a remarkably important topic as well, and it gives us a chance to continue checking out amazing games from the decades past. So I just wanted to mention that I have just reached 2,000 subscribers this month. I'm amazed. I honestly don't know why anyone subscribes to me, but I am super grateful for every single subscriber I have. Thank you for anyone who's watching my video as well. Uh, you know, thank you for giving me your support. If you aren't a subscriber yet, consider clicking that bell. And if you want to do one better, of course, ring that bell for notifications when I release new content. Also, this video will be coming out on the same day that I'm starting the Humble Bundle reviews for May. I stream those over on Twitch. I stream other stuff as well on Tuesdays. Uh, and then for the Humble Bundle reviews, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday as well. So if you want to check that out, check me out there. With that said, though, if you want to stay on YouTube, I have two videos for you to check out as well. My video on the challenge of reviewing multiplayer games titled Better With Friends, which gives you an idea what it's about. And since we're talking about the old retro games, I think you should check out a website called UHS Hints if you like them. Um, the best way to get unique walkthroughs for old adventure games as well. Until then, I'm King Link, and thanks for watching.